The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Alliance Australia Life Insurance Limited, ABN 27076 033 782, AFSL 296 559, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hello everyone, my name is Jamie McIntyre, Director and Financial Planner at Mac Financial in Geelong. I love being part of the financial planning profession and in particular helping people build and enjoy their wealth. Together with the Ensemble team, we have put together a retirement podcast series to dig into the retirement advice space. I hope you enjoy and pick up some great ideas in today's episode. At Allianz Retire Plus, we believe that all Australians should be able to live their lives with certainty and not have to worry about tomorrow's what-ifs, market volatility, or whether they have enough money for the future. That's why we're committed to delivering innovative retirement income solutions with a guaranteed income for life. We're proud to be part of the Allianz family that's been helping Australians for over 100 years. With Allianz Retire Plus, it all adds up to certainty. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of the Retirement Podcast Series. In today's episode, we are going to talk about behavioural biases and retirement. Our guest today is James Wortley. James is the founder of Enlightened Financial Solutions and Video Advice in Australia. He is also a founding shareholder of Lumiant. Referencing James' LinkedIn profile, he says, Our winning aspiration for our client is... It's about you living your best life. You work hard through your working life to get to retirement, and it is now that time for you to enjoy the fruits of your labor. Don't leave a big lump sum of cash. So today, James and I are going to chat about biases and how they can impact retirement, the role of the advisor in identifying biases, overcoming them, and tailoring advice to clients with these biases. James Worley, welcome to today's podcast. Thanks, Jamie. It's good to be here with you. Yeah, likewise. I'm looking forward to today. And look, let's kick off today and start with client biases. And what are some of the biases that are common for clients as they move into retirement in your experience, James? Well, there's, and I did a little bit of cheating. I did say that you're up front that um, certainly chat GBT has actually helped me with a few of these biases. Just one of those ones that uh, that we've always seen, but but probably haven't put a name around it. So Probably the, the one thing that actually wasn't in my list of 10 was longevity bias. And Jamie, you might have seen this before as well, because when we talk about clients about how long your money is going to last, we talk about average life expectancies. But then I get a group of clients that say, oh, it doesn't matter. I probably won't be here in 10 or 15 years time. So they've got that bias that they're actually going to live an early life, whether it's their parents that have passed early or the life that they actually have led over that 65 years or 70 years, they've lived, lived life hard uh, and they just don't expect, expect that they're actually going to live through to their life expectancy. That's, uh, so I thought that was a really interesting one, uh, whether, whether, and the bias on the other side as well is my parents are still alive. I expect that we're going to live through to 100 years of age. So that, that's a good one to start with. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? I, I experienced that as well, James, that's for sure. Um, and you're right. I, I, I suppose you could dig into advisor's bias. We lean into the uh, life tables and, and we talk to clients about, okay, we've got to get you to there and 50% will die before that age and 50% will die after. Um, so we probably have our own biases around longevity as well. No, we do. We do. And, and the question that we always ask our clients is, okay, what happens, especially if you've got that bias towards living, uh, thinking they're going to have an, a pretty early life and, uh, and say 10 to 15 years, is what happens if you actually live through to 85? What does that actually mean to you? And uh, would you live life differently? Yeah, well, well, that's it, isn't it? I, um, I, I suppose for those that think that they are going to die prior to the life table um, with that bias, we, we need to work around that and have a deeper conversation with them about, um, well, I suppose we're talking about the, the life table and, and the odds of them living to the life table. So we've got to tailor our advice around that as well, don't we? 
And, and this is where we change as financial advisors. It's not just financial advice in relation to investment strategies or or what we're looking to do, uh, our retirement strategy as well. But uh, but we then sort of talk about okay, their health. What's what's actually happening from uh, our health standards in today's life? People are living longer. Um, there's there's certainly uh, uh, can, can, people that do have cancer. Uh, a lot of them are actually getting through the cancer now these days. So uh, so I think that modern medicine, we're actually talking a lot more broadly to our clients about about different types of issues that that they will face throughout their lifetime. Yeah, I think that's an important theme for all client interactions, which I I use in air quotes, the industry doesn't necessarily understand that every client or every client, uh, husband and wife or family is very unique and they all have different needs, don't they? Oh, they certainly do. Mate, let's talk about what's number two on the list there that you have. Well, well, that was my number 11. So I'll, I'll go back to, so number one was present bias. So the bias involves giving more weight to immediate rewards and gratification than to future benefits. People may prioritize current spending over saving for retirement, leading to insufficient savings and inadequate financial preparation for retirement. That's an interesting word, is it? Yeah, I think uh, for me, uh, that to me, in how I might experience that or how I have experienced that is those that are spending more than they earn and they, they haven't prepared well enough um, well, when I say well enough, from an asset pool, they haven't prepared well enough, but if they continue to spend on the same path, they're in a bit of trouble. They're going to run out of money as well, aren't they? Yeah. And that's the one thing, Jamie, I think, especially for us being around, being financial advisors for over 25 years, you just, you see it so many times where the client might be living off, might be $150,000 a year, but their goal for retirement is to live off 60000 or $70,000. So it's a big cut. So for us, we need to make sure that we're actually providing good advice to them, uh, having a good understanding with what are they spending their money on now, what will change, what will, what will the tax implications be as well. So you look, you're not going to be paying as much tax. Uh, but alternatively, uh, this is the type of level of income that you actually have. But understanding also, uh, like, like we're a little bit different in financial advice. We want them to live their best life. We'd love to be able to see everything they've actually earned that they spend that money over their lifetime because that's it, isn't it? You work hard all your life. You build up that nice little nest egg. Uh, we want them to actually spend all their money through their lifetime. So it's uh, so it's work hard, play hard, uh, live hard. Absolutely. And if we all had the magic date of death and you and I could plan exactly to it, we could do some amazing things there and make sure they spend every last cent, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think the other part to that is that generational change. And you see with the baby boom, a lot of baby boomers coming through now but they still want to make sure that they're actually leaving their kids with, with substantial capital. Uh, I don't know if you're seeing that, Jamie, but, uh, but certainly we're, we're still seeing that generation, whereas I, I think over the next 10 to 15 years, I think that, that potentially will change a little bit more. Uh, I think you're right, and that's, uh, that seems to be a bias in that generation or the current generation that are retiring, and, and we're really talking about those in their 60s to mid-60s, um, starting to meet with clients that are in their mid fifties, they're building into retirement, and, and they certainly don't hold that bias. They're more of the view that we'll spend everything, and they can, the children can get uh, one half or one third of the house that's left. It's starting to change, isn't it? Yeah, and a lot of those, uh, so for the baby boomers anyway, they were brought up uh, well, early lives through the war period and after the war, so they didn't have a lot of money. So they were taught as young kids to make sure that. Uh, w- when you spend money, you make sure that you're actually spending on the right things, um, but they just didn't have a lot. So I think what they were taught from their parents, they've actually learned that, and and then hopefully that they're passing that on to their, their kids as well. So that that next gen Gen X, I suppose. Yeah, the baby boomers, the boomers were from the uh, the generation of spend less than you were, and make sure you tuck some away and. Um, and and they're also forced to do that in some ways because if you rocked up to the bank manager without some demonstrated savings, uh, there was no home loan either. Yeah, and, and I think this uh, we're, we're talking about this uh, capital amount of money as well. Like, and I could bring in my father-in-law as well. I've just saw them for their annual review, and uh, and he just wants to make sure he leaves all his money to to the girls. He doesn't want to spend any capital. That's just the way he's brought up, and wants to make sure that. That they're going to be financially right, not only uh, them, but also the grandchildren as well. So there's actually going to be a nest egg that passes through from generation to generation. Yeah, absolutely. That uh, deferred gratitude for that generation is a habit. Yeah. Uh, not gratitude, but um, deferred gratification, I should say. 
So, so moving on, what what else? What have we got on uh, number two from no, number two? We've we've, we've friends. yeah, we got loss aversion. So a big one that we always deal with every day. But this the the way it states it loss aversion refers to the tendency to feel the pain of losses more acutely than the pleasure of gains. This bias can lead to overly conservative investment choices in retirement accounts, resulting in lower returns over time and potentially inadequate funds for retirement. Yeah, I, I definitely experienced this myself, uh, James. Um, and for us, yeah, I suppose it's a broader conversation of, of how to work within that loss aversion framework. Um, look, for us, and I think I spoke about this in an earlier podcast, is you know, the first most important thing we talk to clients about is having an amount in cash or the like, maybe term deposits, and that amount should reflect three years of your spending or thereabouts. Um, you know, that helps with that loss aversion conversation, doesn't it? Oh, it certainly does, yeah. The, the good old bucket strategy, it works really well. Yep. Um, what other strategies have you you implemented um, or, or work with clients on to help them understand loss aversion or, or put things in place that, that help them, uh, I suppose, remove that bias? Yeah, yeah, and I, I think the other the other part to why they do have that bias is that they've worked really hard all their lives, and they just don't want to lose that capital or make sure that that, that capital is going to last them through their lifetime. So there's that real big worry uh, for them. So yeah, I, I think the bucket strategy always works really well. It's actually understanding uh, what clients want out of life, uh, and this is the interesting part for for our retirees. There's a couple of things. Number one, uh, want to make sure your your capital lasts through to your retirement. Uh, are you happy to draw down that capital? What does it actually look like? What do you want your kids to be able to inherit? So, so it's asking those really good questions on what the client wants uh, uh, without any bias coming from us. Uh, and then sort of building the strategies around that. And, and for us, I know when projections, we're not big ones on projections, but we use them every annual review uh, for our clients is let's have a look at the return on your investment. Let's have a look at uh, what's the chances of negative returns. And we're probably doing that more now in the last six months than we ever had before, just to make sure clients fully understand their risk profile and what type of negative return you can have. Uh, and again, probably throws in a little bit of a bias in relation to what where the economic world is today, uh, where where there's a lot of talk about recession and going into recession. Uh, what are the things that we need to be able to do uh, as part of us as the financial advisors, but then also talking to our clients about as well. So this real loss of um, aversion. And, and Again, because we've been around a lot longer, we've been through the GFCs where we've seen markets fall. We've had a lot of people retire uh, through that sort of 2007. Uh, a lot of the uh, miners up here that actually had some good capital in their superannuation funds actually went back to work in 2008, 2009 because they saw really big hits on their superannuation funds. So, so it's probably something that we haven't seen for yeah, a good, good 15, 16 years. Yeah, and that, I mean, that's an interesting one for biases. Uh, for me, James, I, I kicked off uh, 1998, 99. So um, experienced or came into, uh, and back then it was an industry, not necessarily a profession, um, and came into it. And in the first couple of years, ex well, the first year we experienced amazing returns on things like tech and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then learned pretty quickly that... Um, you can start to have a bias about those things if you if you don't look deeper into let's call it average returns for sectors and things like that. Um, we can also have a pretty big bias as well, and clients will come in with those biases. You know, my my friend down the street, he's got returns on while well, in today's market, it's probably Bitcoin, right, or or a uh, crypto. So we, I think we need to be pretty cautious about that type of bias as well. Oh, that's right, and and this is where the charts work really well over. Over the history of share markets since 1980, and taking it all the way to where it is today, making sure clients fully understand that there is volatility. But uh, like I'll always come back to that principle rule: number one, don't put your eggs in one basket. Make sure that we diversify across those asset classes, and depending on what your risk aversions are, uh, will depend on how much money we actually have in defensive versus growth assets. So, so but they're the core conversations that we're having with our clients, and especially for retirees, it's. It is. They've worked hard all their lives to be able to build this nest egg. They don't want to be able to take too much risk and see it actually all evaporate really quickly. Tell me, James, what sort of feedback are you getting 
from clients through this period? Are some a bit resistant to this different type of information or are they embracing it or is it giving them more comfort? Tell me a bit more. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a little bit different than that. We're a values-based advice business. Um, so when, when we're talking about strategies, uh, uh, we're also talking about their life strategies, what's really important in life, giving them full accountability of what their values are. Uh, and, uh, and I know that might have been in the previous podcast that you actually did, uh, where we're actually talking about those people are retiring. What are those things that they're going to do, especially if you've worked all your lives and then you actually then go back and your partner's been at home, is uh, the partner would like to be able to kick you out the door to say, okay, look, go and find something else to do and don't come back into my little domain here uh, as, as part of my the retirement strategy. But uh, yeah, so it, it's, it's really interesting. I probably just lost a little bit of track there. <laughs> <laughs> the question was <laughs> no it was more around that's okay let's say to bring us back on track my question was what how, how's the feedback been from your client yeah. with this focus on um you know loss aversion and yeah. your focus on you know markets uh, can have downtimes yeah they take it well but the thing is when, when we really have those tough conversations actually when you're going through a negative return Mm. Uh, a bit like even 2022, we saw negative returns, but they weren't big blowout negative returns that we had through the GFC and, and early 2000s as well with the tech wreck. Um, so so I, I find that that experience that we've had over those two harsher periods where you've got sell downs of more than 10%, they're the hard conversations that you need to be able to, um, uh, that you're having with your clients. So uh, I, I think right now it's okay because the returns are actually been pretty solid over the last 10 years. Um, it's only when that consistency of negative returns start to come through. And, and probably the other side to this also is we're now starting to see a cash rate jump up. So a cash rate being around about the sort of that 5 and 6% return, that sort of changes the dynamic on investment as well, where you can say, okay, look, we're not going to take any risk and still get 5% return versus a share market that is a lot more riskier um, potentially coming into a recession. And uh, is that our capital going to be there for that asset class? Yeah, preserving some more capital at this point in time. And, and uh, I think the right word is taking advantage of that opportunity in the current market as well. Yeah, there's, there's an interesting, um, so, some research that we had in relation to just two different portfolios. But if they got the same returns, but they had it opposite ways round, um, would, you, would you be comfortable with your financial advisor uh, as part of the strategy? And the answer actually came back and said no, because all, of, all those, uh, the retiree client that actually had a good amount of money uh, had a negative return right at the end and actually lost sort of 30 percent of their capital at one period of time. So where the conversation probably would have been, okay, do you need to be able to take this risk? Your capital's actually grown really well. That's another conversation that we should be having with our clients. Is okay? Do we take some risk off the table? Yeah, um, definitely. That well for us, we're having those conversations as well um, about taking some risk off the table. Um, and I think what we're talking about as well, and uh, due to us both having you know twenty plus years experience in those more significant GFC type events, um, when we reference negative returns in twenty two, those returns didn't linger. They uh, they they came and went, so it wasn't it was a difficult conversation. Maybe at one review meeting, um, but that went away pretty quick. So it's pretty important to uh, I suppose really demonstrate to clients that significant events can come and linger. Yeah, and, and the industry super funds with some of the returns that they're putting out for retirees as well. So when you got in the marketplace saying we're getting a 9 10% return over the last 20 or 30 years with industry super funds, is clients still hear that number, 10%. Oh, wait up, I'm, I'm only getting 6 or 7% or whatever return that they're getting on their portfolio. They're always going to compare and there's a, that little bit of that Actually, it's a number number six here, herd mentality, where they actually uh -huh. hear that return and go, oh, wait up, oh, yeah, I, how come I'm not getting that return? I should be getting that. And then once the advisor starts talking through that about the actual asset allocation on those particular balanced funds that might be 90 95% into growth assets, uh, it's a good conversation to be able to have to talk, again, about that sort of risk in their portfolio. Well, let's, let's talk about herd mentality and maybe referencing the industry funds in some way, but pr probably all big corporate type arrangements are seeking a herd mentality to, I suppose, promote what they're doing or promote their product at scale. Um, how do you work through 
Well, referencing back to industry funds, they they generally advise to specific sectors as well. Um, how do you work through the conversation of herd mentality with your, well, probably more your new clients, because I'm sure you've educated your current clients about that. But how would you go about educating a new client about that bias? Yeah, we, we still start from scratch. Uh, so, so first of all, because there's two parts to risk profiling, isn't there? Number one is actually understand what type of risk that they have but it comes back to what's the actual strategy on your investments. So if it's a retirement superannuation strategy, then we can actually understand what that risk profile is. But there might also be capital expenses or whatever it might be over the next 12 months. So it's a different risk profile. So so we're a little bit different when we talk about conversations. Oh, look, you might have one overarching risk profile, but for each strategy, you're actually going to have a different risk profile for the way that we're actually going to invest your money. Uh, so again, a bit, a bit like the uh, emergency fund, what does that emergency fund look like? Is it twenty thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand uh, dollars? Is there any capital expenses that you've got coming up over the next two to three years that might be a different investment strategy than what we would have uh, for when we look at the big bulk of the retirement money uh, because it's more long term investment. So, so I think that's that's one of the conversations that we're actually having uh, with our with our clients. Uh, it still comes back to that that real basic conversation about returns is, uh, look, based on your, your capital in superannuation, if you're a 50-50 risk profile, then the expectation is 5 or 6% return over the long run. This is what's going to happen with your capital. Are you comfortable with that with that decision? Are you happy, happy for your capital to either run down uh, or stay in line? Is it going to increase with inflation or is it going to continue to keep on growing? So, so depending on what the capital that they do have. Yeah, and I think one thing I sort of picked up through that uh, James is look every every new client comes to you with a series of biases based on where they've received their information from maybe from the people they spend time with um, and, and it's I suppose the most important thing as an advisor is to get to the depth of that bias and, and really get to the depth of what is important to them and I, we, we share values of having values based uh, planning um, and, and you've got to get an understanding of what it is they really want um, and figure out if they can do it all. Really, isn't it? It is. It is. That's that's. Uh, they're not going to be able to get any extra capital if they finish work. Then this is what they've got. Uh, so we need to make sure that we've got a structured plan uh, for them uh, for the future uh, to make sure they can achieve all their life goals. Yeah, and I suppose referencing rather than reference reference industry funds, but let's just reference a superannuation or retirement account that has one investment option. And each time you take money out, you're effectively taking money out of the investment option. I think, um, you know, if you go in with that strategy and, you know, if one of your goals is to take a $50,000 trip around the world and that happens to be July in 2024 and the market's down 20% in March 2024, uh, everyone gets pretty fearful of taking money out of that portfolio at that time, don't they? Oh, they certainly do. It's a- yeah, just it reminded me of another, and I don't know if it's a bias, but probably even a client goal is clients want to be able to maximize any selling benefits that they can get in return. Yeah. And yeah, and I, I think we would see that. I think it's nearly a number one goal. That's We'll always question as a financial buyer, is selling important to you? And then a lot of people will say, yes, I paid a lot of tax over the, over the days. We want to be able to get something back. So again, that sort of brings in that little bit of a bias. We're actually talking about that loss aversion and everything else where- uh, some clients have got too much money. Uh, so do you want to be able to reduce your capital just to be able to get any type of Centrelink benefit? So there's a bit of a balance, and you probably see that, Jamie, in the conversations you're having with your clients. Oh, look, we certainly do. Um, that one's a really interesting one. Um, and I think the way you framed it up, that most people will will have a sense that they would like to get something back from Centrelink or something back, let's call it from the government or government support that they feel as though they've done that bit through their journey and getting access to Centrelink. But it can become a bias where they will take actions to get that dollar of Centrelink, which is not actually that beneficial for their longer term capital and, and, and financial future either. So it's an interesting one to work through with each client, that's for sure. Yeah, and this is and as part of the values based advice and goals based advice as well, you're getting clients to prioritize what's more important to them. Is it making sure that you've got capital that you want to be able to provide to your to your estate when you're gone? 
Uh, are you happy to be able to draw down that capital and just make sure that you're going to live your best life? Uh, it's actually understanding that, prioritizing what those goals are. So if, uh, if Centrelink is their number one priority, okay, then these are the things that we can be able to help you with that. Uh, but it also might mean Centrelink might be uh, for them 10 years in, in 10 years' time. Uh, so, But at least uh, for us, making sure that we educate clients so they can fully understand what we're looking to do for them. And then the other part is implications as well. If we do this and go this way, this is the implications of your capital. Yeah, and the, the, the ongoing trade-offs. Um, I think you can chase Centrelink as quick as you like, but generally speaking, you're going to have to consume money, um, maybe not on things that you actually want or need. Um, it's a bit like chasing a tax deduction and buying something you don't actually need just so you pay less tax. Yeah, yeah, we see that all the time, don't we? <laughs> yes, we do. They, they usually do it without us knowing. They do, they do. We find out later. What, what, give me another one there on your chat GPT list for us to dig into. Uh, confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is the tendency to seek and interpret information in a way that confirms pre-existing beliefs. The bias can lead retirees to disregard important information that challenges their retirement plans or investment choices. Yeah, that's it. We, we nearly dug into that one earlier when we were talking yeah. about the, the bias sort of um, and we'll reference the industry funds because they are big promoters of their returns and, and we all see them. Um, you don't often hear too many financial planners promoting the returns of how they're going. Yeah, it's a real confirmation bias that I saw it on the telly. It must be true. I need to get that return, right? Oh, it is. It is. And and that's and again, all good advisors, I know we all do this, is just show them about the asset allocation. This is a return. Compare apples with apples. It's... Um, it's a pretty standard uh, conversation that we have with our clients, so they fully understand what the implications are. Might even, might even move into like the next one we had was recency bias, and this is yeah. potentially where we are now, where returns are sort of picking up. Recency bias involves giving more weight to recent events or experiences when making decisions. Retirees might base their investment decisions on recent market performance rather than considering long-term trends. Yeah. Um, and you referenced earlier, and we've referenced this in, in one of the other podcasts also, being able to look at an index chart. Um, we, we always think that that's a really good reference to re- reference the broader index. Um, and particularly, I mean, there's a couple out there that you can go and have a look at, but they'll give you, you know, up to 50 years uh, return profile, and it'll show you the volatility through there. It'll show you the average return. It'll pick up the GFC. Uh, I suppose we're talking a little bit more there to shares, but, but they will also pick up fixed interest and everything else like that. And I think if you can give clients a, a longer time frame of thinking, that will help them uh, move past the recency bias. Yeah, and and I think those that I can remember the asset class returns. I think we've been using it for about twenty years, uh, just showing okay the last the best asset class traditionally won't be the best asset class of the following year. So, and potentially if it was a good return, then potentially it might be a negative return the following year. So, so giving that clients a good understanding, just again, bring it all back to basics. Don't put your eggs in one basket. What's the return that you're actually after and making sure that we structure a portfolio uh, around that and still having that same conversation with those retirees. If their capital is increasing, do they need to be able to have that six or 7% return? Uh, maybe they'd be, uh, yeah, maybe they, based on their goals, only need a four or five percent return. So, be able to take some risk off, uh, uh, off their portfolio if, um, if required. Yeah, you can work your way through the trade-offs, and, and you're right. It's a, it doesn't have to be about the actual return being high over time. Um, you can get a greater balance with a lower return, looking at everything in its whole, um, and providing that unique, tailored advice to people. Yeah. So yeah, so so I think recency bias is okay. We, we've gone through. So Ukraine's still going. Ukraine, Russia. Uh, we've got a couple of elections coming through shortly. The U.S. election next year. Um, so that's that's going to change uh, a little bit more the dynamics. Uh, I know we've got a local Queensland government election as well. So 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 things things obviously are going to change. And and sometimes it's not from an economic point of view. They're just other issues that we we potentially haven't thought about. So Taiwan, we've always got these different issues, and uh, 
Uh, and I suppose when you look at the history of where we've come from over the last 30 years, there's always different things that have happened during the year. So it's making sure that uh, from a client's bias point of view where they're worried about all these things and we've got the rather conspiracy maybe, maybe even lead on to those conspiracy theories jamie because we see that all the time clients will always come up with oh uh yeah look where we money superannuation i think this, this is one i've had what about about six months ago uh if the government gets in trouble they can take your superannuation off you <laughs> yeah <laughs> have you heard that well, one before we oh, well the government will change the rules again is what yes, they say. Yes. But it's a really uh, I love the way they hang on. They'll change the rules again, and it's yeah. like okay, we'll define that to me. How do you think that could look? And uh, yeah, it's it, it's some fear, isn't it? Or oh, they they don't trust the government. Uh, there's many like that. Yeah, there is, there is, and again, it's just having that conversation with what's important important to them and. Uh, and hopefully, if it's really far-fetched conspiracy, we can knock it on the head. Uh, sometimes that might mean you have to go into Google and uh, and actually get some facts on the table uh, for them so they can actually read it and see it. Because uh, sometimes you, you might be talking to the client, but you can see they're just not listening, uh, but, but especially for the, those really headstrong conspiracy theorists. Well, absolutely. No, I think what we're mainly talking today is about well, a lot of biases, right? No, I think um, history is a really good indicator of what the future looks like. We, we don't know exactly what the future looks like, but we've seen there's always been significant events that have occurred. Who would have thought we'd get locked down for a thing called COVID, right? So we're not sure what's around the corner, but but history would tell us there's significant events. I mean, we go all the way back to world wars, depressions, etc. but there's been something significant happening in the world Um Every 10 years or thereabouts, that's going to have an impact on markets. And when we say have, it, have an impact on markets, it has an impact on economic activity and the performance of companies around the world. Yeah, yeah, it just changed. The, and this is why clients want to make sure that uh, that they're getting good advice. Because the one thing we can probably guarantee is the government legislation will change, economic conditions will change. And this is why we have financial advice. That's why we want to make sure that we're providing ongoing financial advice. So. Uh, so, so some some things we can't control, but um, but from a strategic point of view, when we're talking about estate planning and cash flow, there's certainly a, a lot of good things that we can actually provide to our clients to make sure that uh, we can we can try to protect their their wealth and their income and give them a full understanding. So, uh, I'll always love that sleep at night test. That's what we do for our clients, making sure that you can sleep at night. So it doesn't matter what headline is in the paper when you wake up the next day, you know that. The financial advisor's got that under control for you. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I One word I think that sums up a fair bit of that and a word we use very often with our clients is that we'll help you navigate all of this. Um, we'll put in a really good, we'll build you a really good plan based off a lot of work and going through that history piece and education, um, helping them with potential biases. Um, and, and you build that plan out and it's all about navigating it from there because these things, are they're coming. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know one of the things that we talked to Lumia is just this, you're driving on a highway, you've got these guardrails, but the highway just doesn't go straight. There's always going to be things that change. And for no, number one, from a client's point of view, it might be uh, their health, it might be some family's health. Uh, there's always going to be some changes. Again, we talked about economic sit, uh, situations or, or they might have to help people out financially in their journey that they'd never thought that they'd have to do. So there's always going to be change there, and that's our our job is making sure that we can keep those clients within those guardrails on an ongoing basis. And and that's the advice, isn't it? I, I think that that's that's why we we preach the values and and goals based advice. We can't control investments sometimes. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, but we can certainly understand where our clients are, what type of experience that we can provide to clients to make sure that that they're happy and comfortable living their best life and not having to look over their shoulder about everything else in relation to their their financial um their their financial assets yeah absolutely and and referencing again the bucket strategy and and everything that gives them well, a significant amount of comfort for when these events do occur yeah um do you have another significant bias there for us james oh, there's a couple more uh i'll just read this one endowment effect so the endowment effect is a tendency to overvalue items or assets simply because they belong to us in retirement, this bias can lead individuals to hold on to underperforming investments due to emotional attachment, even when better options are available. So, 
So the one thing I'll probably ask you, Jamie, I'll put you on the spot, is have you had those clients where they've held on to AMP shares? I'll use AMP as an example because a lot of people inherit AMP shares and uh, and they might have inherited through a policy, through through parents or whatever, whatever but they're actually holding on that those shares only because that was given to them was one of those one of those freebies that they actually received. Uh, so, so they've got that emotional connection to them. Yeah, we have experienced that. I um, look, we've had an association. We're licensed by AMP Financial Planning and have been uh, throughout my twenty three odd years. Um, and across that twenty three year journey, uh, when I started out, people all got their AMP shares, right? So I've been talking to clients and well, policyholders back then about their AMP shares and. And they hung on to them for a period because when Mr. Trumbull came out and announced everything, it was all, well, it was all hock a hoop. It was all exciting. They were $20 a share and, and everyone had a big windfall. And But over time, they've seen them diminish. Um, so so through probably a, a, a 10-year time frame, there was still optimism around this, called this endowment effect, about, oh, they'll come back, they'll come back, they'll come back. And then probably the last five to 10 years, uh, that endowment effect's finally gone, if that makes sense, because yeah. um, from a share price performance, the, the it hasn't been very strong for AMP um, through the last 10 years. So the endowment effect did die off over time, but it was there for a long time. You know, they hung on to them, they hung on to them. And look, there's probably many, many more companies out there that uh, that happens with as well. Um, but yeah, definitely the endowment effect we've seen in in that firsthand experience. Yeah, what, what, are you client? Are you start are you still seeing that with your clients that you're talking to today that have those AMP shares? It's less significant a conversation. So most of the mums and dads have sold them by now. There's very few and far between that that still hold them because really they could give them and they didn't know anything about shares. It was a bit like let's call it everyone that bought Telstra shares to yeah. shift gears as well. They had an endowment effect because they. Oh, I shouldn't speak for everyone, but part of what I've experienced is they trusted the government. It was going to be really, it was going to be really good for them. They thought, and they had that endowment effect for a while because it was for a lot. It was their first significant decision about investing that they made on their own. And then I'm sure there's another bias that would be there of why they hung onto them. They're emotionally attached to them. Yeah. Uh, feeling very empowered that they'd made their own financial decisions and then feeling quite disempowered over the journey as the performance of Telstra has caused. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've had, oh, and as another example, we've had a lot of clients that have inherited shares from, from their parents that might have passed or through, through an inheritance. And it might be that we've actually done the risk profile and they might be a, a sort of 50-50 risk profile, but they've got Four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars worth of blue chip Aussie shares. So if you're having that conversation about asset allocation and risk profile, they might have to look to reduce that exposure, but they won't do that because of that emotional um, connection with those shares because they received that from from their parents. Yeah, and I, look, I think a great way to work through that bias that that portfolio of let's uh, call them blue chip shares. We're a big fan of index investing, um, so w- we take a look at the portfolio and the performance over the previous 10-year period, compare it to the index, and take a look at it from that perspective. Um, just help help with a broader perspective of, if you own 200 of the top 200 companies rather than 12, uh, how, did that, how does that look? So we found that's been really eye-opening for clients as well to help with that, that bias to that. Mm. How, how about the little gold mining companies or those real small technology companies that that are oh it's going to get there it's going to get there but uh in the end it's uh it's still not doing anything they've got that bias and look it's going to make us rich one day yeah that's a really interesting one as well i think you would have experienced something similar to me in that space probably up until five years ago let's call it regulatory settings meant that people could promote buying into penny stocks and people would do that um, and buy those. Um, I think that's now been overtaken by crypto. Um, another sort of, oh, I shouldn't say unregulated, but got a lot of regulation. Um, people are receiving information from unregulated places. And I, that's really the one now that I think everyone, oh, I got a little bit of crypto. I was in it for a little while, couldn't handle it, I got out. 
Um, what about you? Uh, that's more probably the younger ones. That's not really in this retirement space we're talking about, though. Do you have many in the retiree space? Not a lot, but we still get the questions every now and then. There's um, there's retirees, and that's one of those things where we're talking about, okay, what do you want to be able to do in retirement? And for a lot of them, they want to play around with the stock market and just have a uh, have something of interest. So so that's there's well, we've got a, a lot of clients that actually just like to be able to just play around with some of those investment markets and see how they go. But it's uh, sometimes I don't think it's actually about making any money. I think for them, it's just having something to do, having something to research, something to have a look at, and uh, and that's uh, yeah, it's it, but for some people, it's actually really good for their health. I, yeah, I, I agree with you there. And there, there's another element to that is having something to talk about with the people they spend time with, which is a really important element for all retirees as they shift into retirement. Yeah, it's it's a huge one because it's uh, as part of the values that we talk to our clients. So so through Lumia, we've actually, actually got a card game and it talks about eight dimensions of well-being in sixteen cards, and. Uh, and a few of those cards might be volunteer my time. What does that actually look like? Feel confident in my finances. It's interesting when you actually really nut down uh, what they actually mean by that particular card and why do they actually pick that particular card. And uh, yeah, some really good understanding with what their values are and what's really important to them uh, in their lives. And and that's the benefit out of providing uh, what we do, providing that accountability. Uh, so not only just financial, but also accountability around how do they live their best life based on what their values are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think those cards are what a lot of good advisors do from a, in a personal way, but those cards are a great reference point for maybe the younger advisors just starting to work in this space to to enable them to dig deep into what clients really want. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and I, the, 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 last, the last bit, and I'll summarise, I think we've covered the majority of those, um, those biases, uh, but the, the summary there for chat GPT, I'll call them out again, uh, these biases can collectively lead to inadequate savings, suboptimal investment decisions, and overall poor retirement planning. Recognizing and addressing these biases through education, professional financial advice, and self-awareness can help individuals make more rational and optimal decisions for their retirement. So a bit of kudos for financial advisors there. And fantastic, and I think so it should be. I, I think I've noticed a lot of things with Judge Chat. Chat GPT, they they tend to reference the financial advisor to uh, get good advice, which is like that's that's pretty empowering for us in financial planning. Now, James, we um, we used to get kicked down the road a lot. Yeah, absolutely. It's come a long way, and uh, yeah, I certainly won't take any anything back. I think we've actually learned a lot. So again, I, th- I started back in '98 as well. So yeah, '90 90, '97, '98. But uh, yeah, going back to the days. But we we always talk about sort of going in um in in cycles and uh and it's interesting when you sort of look back at it uh the, the way that we do video advice at the moment where we're providing advice and we're doing it a little bit differently but you can nearly go back to what it was in back in 98 where you could do an advice on on two pages remember those days i do i certainly do and uh, and we're going back to the future soon james no i'm hoping so i'm hoping so not that we're here to talk about this, but you know, product providers um, were the drivers of, and I'll use the word industry again. And and for us, we'll do our part as the profession, and the product providers are going to do their part for the product industry, um, and it's going to encourage them to continue to build better products. And I, I think the separation is really good. Well, how do you, James? What are some of the strategies you take to discuss biases with clients? And maybe communicate with clients broadly to help them with some of that. Well, a word that Chat GPT used, which was self awareness. Yeah, self awareness. Look, as part when we when we bring on a client, uh, we don't provide the usual statement of advice with the, the full on plan up front. Uh, so so we take it based on prioritising advice. So pretty well a twelve month contract for clients, uh, and just prioritise what's really important to them, and then actually continue to just knock those different goals and strategies off over that 12 months. Uh, so but what we're actually finding is instead of the traditional financial advices where you provide the statement of advice, you see the client, you do some implementation, you see them six or 12 months uh, later, uh, where we're doing a lot of discussions in relation to investment preferences. So I think that's one's a key one. I think that one gets a little bit lost uh, where I think advisors need to be able to spend a little bit more time about what's really important to clients about their investment preferences 
uh, which which it, it comes back into risk profile asset allocation or risk profiling questionnaire as well. But uh, having an understanding with clients, whether it be uh, ESG, uh, might be something that's really important to them. Cost is always something that we talk about to clients. Is cost really important? Is it more dynamic asset allocation? Do they want that rather than static asset allocation? Uh, so I, I think when we actually talk to clients over a 12-month period rather and just a continuous because uh, we, we might be see it for, for one of our new clients, uh, we'd probably see them or talk to them at least once a month over a 12-month period. So what that allows us to be able to do is actually have a good understanding with who they are, um, how they take investments so we can talk about the investments, the volatility and how they're actually going with that volatility. Uh, do they need to be able to make any changes? Are they, do they want to make changes? Do they have a bias to be able to change? Uh, I think we've always had those clients there where they, some of them just don't like losing money and want the change for the sake of doing some change uh, to, to make them feel a little bit better. Uh, so I think having a good relationship with clients and really getting down to, oh, I talk about, like I said, peeling the onion, is that financial advice, I think pr- where we came from, we might have got down one or two layers, whereas values and goals-based advice is getting down that fourth and fifth layer of the onion, um, which is really understanding what, what's what's the importance and what are they trying to achieve and what's their, uh, I suppose, what's their, what does the dynamics of their life look like and, and how can we help them on their life's journey? So, so I think putting all that together, so again, a little bit, uh, a lot of words there, but uh, I, I think for us is making sure that we continually talk to our clients. And I think this is the evolution of, of financial advice as well. It's not about a strategy review or an annual review. It's just continual advice that we actually do. We, we, we're still in this, we need to do a review, an annual review meeting every year. And that's really comes back to that's a lot more on a compliance point of view. There's a lot of things that we do with our clients and talking them over that 12 months where there's no need for an annual review. There might be some documents that we need to fill out uh, or get signed. Um, but other than that, it's really not an annual review because we should be making sure that we're providing that ongoing advice for their clients uh, through and making sure that they're accountable to their goals as well. Yeah, and look, I agree with that. I think um, the the compliance review is really a constructive product um, to to satisfy uh, things associated with the product. We're similar to you, James, in many ways. Really, we're, we're providing ongoing planning and ongoing advice, and um, and when we cross-reference that with biases, new biases pop up all the time. Um, social circles change, or different marketing influences come into play, um, and it's really important we continue to point out to clients their biases and their blind spots, um, so they can get on with living a good life. And I loved your metaphor of peeling back the onion. Um, I suppose the previous construct of giving us away and do a review, I'm not doing that enough justice, but that was only, you only had to peel back layer one or two, maybe three of that onion. Um, and now it's so important to dig deep and, and get to the core, isn't it? It is. It is. It's, it's everything we do. It did, I think that's where it comes back to the difference between really good financial advice. It's all about us making sure that we can fully understand our clients on where they are, how, how they act in, in different situations as well, whether it be health issues, uh, financial issues, or whatever it might, might, might be, any changes that they have. Uh, and that's where uh, a good relationship is where, where clients will tell us absolutely everything that's going on in their lives because they trust us for who we are and what we do for them. And it's a critical thing, isn't it? Yeah, and I think you'll you'll start to recognise that. And I've recognised that over the past ten years. We're about we're pretty aligned in in the changes we've made again in there, James. And the de- the deeper you dig, the more you find out, the more you understand. You're one of the first people to know when they're having their first grandchild, um, because you get a depth of relationship that's way beyond the money. It's really just about helping them have a better life, isn't it? Oh, it is, and then especially the grandchildren because they just they they love it. That's sometimes for some of them it's their life purpose to be grandparents, and uh, so what can you do? Number one is time. They, obviously, they want to spend as much time as they can with them, uh, but there's also a potential there where they can actually help them financially or build a little nest egg for them as well. So it just opens up so many advice strategies uh, for them as well, and uh, and where ones to be able to lead them. Yeah, and that's another interesting one too, isn't it? Helping retired clients frame up the right way of looking at 
giving money to their children and yeah. their grandchildren and do I save a hundred bucks a week or do I grab it as a lump sum from a from one of my resources at the right point in time yeah uh, yeah just, and one, just in another one and open this up to you because for us that have been around for over 25 years you've got some really good strong relationships with our clients and what financial advisors tend to do is is especially if they've got a really good relationship with their client just don't they go off strategy. They don't go on and follow an agenda because they're talking about the family and friends and, and they're probably talking about stuff there that they probably wouldn't be re- talking about if it was a new financial advice client. So I, I think there's a little bit of a bias there where financial advisors, if they've got really good relationship with clients, making sure that you can put that to the side and still come back to actually understand what those client goals are, their values, what's really important to them and making sure that that they're on track for everything they need to be able to do, that we don't have this bias just to be able to, here we go, let's just have a quick chat here, flick, you know, sign these things and we'll see you in six months' time because we're not doing the re- the best thing by that that client relationship or financial advice relationship. Yeah, I, look, I, I hear you on that at review and I also think um, we can, I don't know if guilty is the right word, but we can get guilty of that bias with different pressures within businesses. I'm a smaller business, so I don't have that issue. We're very focused on not having a, a bias to cut down time spent with clients. Um, so I think that's really good advice, James, for maybe the younger advisors that are that maybe are in a larger practice is just be aware of the bias of you know only having one to three meetings and then presenting an SOA. You're not necessarily going to get the depth that you need to help retired clients or, or about to retire clients, um, you're not going to be able to work through all of their biases and they just keep popping up over time. So I think if you can invest the time at the front um, and that ties into things like pricing and time, you, you'll definitely be in a great position to, well, I suppose not eliminate all of their biases, but be able to educate them, empower them and and help them with that self-awareness as referenced by Chad GPT to put them in a great position to live a great retired life. Yeah. Yep. Completely agree. James Worley, you and I could talk for another three hours, but I'm mindful of the time that we have to spend together today. Today's episode, we've spoken about biases. We've gone down many, many different tracks. And I think that's a reflection on humans are complex. Planning their lives is complex. But we did cover off, well, up up to about 10 biases today in some good detail, and it was some really good conversation. So thank you for your time today, and um, I'm looking forward to the next time we catch up. Thanks, Jamie. It's been a pleasure. Cheers, James.